Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to begin? Look no further. The team at Dodge Media Productions has 20 years of experience as podcast listeners and observing the industry and eight years experience in podcast production. We can help you take your podcast from idea to fruition and we'll make the process seamless and easy. We'll help you with everything from recording and editing to hitting the charts on Apple Podcasts. So what are you waiting for? Contact us today and let's get started. DodgeMediaProductions.com You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. This is episode 156, and we are going to talk about Forrest Gump from 1994, It is available through Prime, so if you have a Prime subscription, you too can enjoy it for no additional cost. It stars Tom Hanks. Rebecca Williams is, she's the nurse that's on the park bench. And I have something about her that I've never, I never knew before. Okay. It also stars Sally Field. Michael Connor Humphreys plays Young Forrest. Robin Wright plays Jenny. Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan. And McKelty Williamson plays Bubba. So I'll just interrupt right now. The the nurse, she talked about her feet hurting. And apparently that is supposed to be a nod, I guess, to Rosa Parks. Because she was a nurse. And when she was on the bus and asked to get into the back, she said something like, no, my feet hurt. And, huh. and so I didn't. I never. I know. I never knew that. But they they dovetailed him into other historical incidents. I'm surprised they didn't go farther there. But that it couldn't have been Rosa Parks because of the time. Because right. cause that when it was shot, it was it was beyond when she famously right yeah because Jenny it was like the 80s, early 80s, I think, mm. late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the time doesn't. But I guess it's just supposed to be a nod. It, the DP was Don Burgess, who did 1986's The Night Stalker and 1989's Breaking Point and 1992's Mo Money. The writer is Winston Groom. He wrote the novel that this is based on, but Eric Roth wrote the screenplay for the film. And it is directed by Robert Zemeckis, who brought us 1984's Romancing the Stone, 1985's Ooh. Back to the Future, and 1988's who framed Roger Rabbit. Oh, and he also did Back to the Futures uh, 2 and 3. So, 1, 2, and 3. I didn't know Zemeckis also did Romancing the Stone. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. This is the, if you haven't been living under a rock, like, if you don't know what the synopsis for Forrest Gump is, <laughs> please stop this recording <laughs> or stop this <laughs> podcast and go watch Forrest Gump. The history of the United States from the 1950s to the 1970s unfolds from the perspective of an Alabama man with the IQ of 75, who yearns to be reunited with his childhood sweetheart. I have a few taglines for you. One is the story of a lifetime. Mm, no. It kind of is, though. But um, It is, but it's too general. Okay. Gump happens. Oh, I like that. Gump happens here. Mm, no. The world will never be the same once you've seen it through the eyes of Forrest Gump. Yeah, I feel like Gump happens. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's even better. It's an iconic line. I don't know where AFI lands on that in famous movie quotes, but it's up there. It It is. It is. I don't know if I took that down, but I did like this, this film. And I believe that line, I can't remember if it's that one or stupid is as stupid does. We're both right, right. rated up there. So I... There is an episode on Netflix of a show called The Movies That Made Us, and I highly recommend it if you enjoyed Forrest Gump because it tells the whole backstory of this film. And this film is almost like, you know, almost like Forrest. It was, you know, the movie that I think I can, I think I can, you know, like it's mm. producer Wendy Feinerman worked so hard to get this movie made. And when she finally did was rewarded because she got the Oscar for best picture. And in 1988, Rain Man came out. So when she approached the studio to say, I want to make this movie on this based on this book, they were like, nope, we've already done a movie about an idiot savant. We don't need another one. 
Is that ridiculous? Like we've told one story about this one kind of person. We don't need to tell it ever again. In retrospect, that seems, of course, he would make Forrest Gump. But I bet I could see at the time, I think it would be easy for a film about somebody who's a little bit slow like Forrest. I, I could see how that would easily go wrong and, and not really resonate with the viewing audience, right? What do you mean by go wrong? That it just wouldn't land. Um, it, this, I think that's such a fine line to not make fun of the character. I see. But also to have him be appealing and an, a protagonist, an active part of his life. So he's doing things so the audience is engaged in. I just feel like that's even more difficult than normal to tell a story where someone cares about the main character. Right. Even more so why Eric Roth should be Eric Roth, Robert Zemeckis and Tom Hanks should be lauded because the entire time we're rooting for Forrest. Right. We like, you want him to come out on top. He's our hero. I mean, he saves people's lives. I'm actually going to throw somebody else in there. I think the editor deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. When Tom Hanks appeared on the actor studio, James Lipton asked him to say life is like a box of chocolates. And he said, that's the equivalent of trying to get De Niro to say, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? I can't do it. But right. anyway, <laughs> he says, um, he revealed he will never say that line for anyone, no matter who asks. I, I actually dispute that. I think if Rita asked, he'd do it. <laughs> and then this movie was like life changing. Due to the success of Lieutenant Dan's character, Gary Sinise has formed a foundation for injured war veterans, which raises up to $30 million a year. He has 12 private jets, which they use to fly the veterans, many sick plus other sick children to various locations around the world. And as of like recent, they have raised $580 million. And so they like, they retrofit homes for veterans. They build new homes that are suitable for their needs since they're, you know, due to their injuries. You and know. it's amazing. I bet Sinise lets him call him Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> he does. He even has a band called the Lieutenant Dan Band. And so he just took this part. He had been taking. Yeah, it was like some TV episodes mm -hmm. and maybe like one TV movie, but he really didn't have like a lot in his. And the parts were more, I'm trying to think of the way, they weren't like alpha male parts. So let me say that. I, you know, right, I'm trying yeah. to. Well, he's a, he's a smaller guy of build, so he probably wasn't cast as like a, a macho kind of heavy. Right. And so he took this kind of just to kind of try a different type of character. And then to have this film completely change his life and probably changed a lot of the career, um, a lot of his other roles that he was offered for the rest of his career. Well, this is, I intend this is the highest praise. I can't conceive of anybody but Sinise doing Lieutenant Dan. Totally, totally. Right. You know, and speaking of actors, curiously, I thought that Bubba, that character, there was more of him in the film. So when we watched uh -huh. the film, I, I remember thinking early on, wow, I thought these things that are happening happened later in the film. We got to the midpoint which on a film that's a little bit long, I think Dustin and I would like to encourage Robert to tighten it up a bit, but I got to the midpoint and I'm like, what's left? I feel yeah. like all the, almost all of the memorable things of the film happened in the first half. So that was one of the things. Another thing I didn't remember was how slutty his mom was. Jeez. <laughs> she was surviving. Well, she was, well, but... Who did she have sex with other than the, the principal? Other than the principal. She slept with the principal to get her son into school. I admire her commitment <laughs> and her intent, but, I mean, 19. I admire her. I don't call her a slut at all. I admire her. She's trying to take care of her kid. Again, I admire that commitment. She's like the guy in Fire Island who's going to get the water. <laughs> I totally admire that. But I just felt like, like not, she's not like, oh, fire. mama is so, she's the, she's an angel. She's a saint. I'm like, well, I mean, she's committed. That's for sure. Not fire. Right? The fire festival. Oh, well, they're both. <laughs> no, they're two different things. Well, yeah, but Fire Island is very popular no, no, with the gay stop. folks. You're going to get yourself in trouble. <laughs> it's not that far off. Okay. Yeah, it was a fire festival. 
I admire that guy's commitment too. No, he, he yeah, he's uh, company everybody man. admires. Yeah, him. yeah. But you want that guy working for you? <laughs> you do. <laughs> okay, one last bit of trivia, and then I will let you tell us what the pickup line for Forrest Gump is. I think part of why Zemeckis was sought after is he had done Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which had a lot of unique for the time. What's the word I'm looking for? Like visual effect. Yeah, visual effects, but like Who Framed Roger Rat had a lot of innovative visual effects and ways that they handled combining the actual actors with the animated actors. And so he could think outside of how can we do this? And so a lot of the stuff that they did with Lieutenant Dan's legs, and he just asked that certain parts of the book be taken out because he thought it was a little too corny. Um, and Forrest in the book is supposed to be like 350 pounds, which then you stop and think about it, like all the running and him being on the football team. And it just, they had to change it up, I think, right. to make it believable. Mm, yeah. So, okay. What is the pickup line for Forrest Gump? Hello, my name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. <laughs> See, and that, that actually is pretty, pretty supports my... It supports your theory. this film is just about Forrest. That is it. It's all about Forrest. Yeah, and I love it because... So the feather floats around while the credits are playing, and right. then the feather floats down and lands near his feet with the dirty Nikes. Right. And he picks it up and he puts it in his suitcase. And if you're paying attention and I wanted to kind of scrub back, but on Amazon, it's not super easy. I have this in my notes. Just, oh. I was paying attention. Okay. Do you want to say, Okay. Yeah. well, I was just going to say, I caught it a little bit too late, but I saw the curious George book was in there. Uh -huh. The ping pong paddle I saw. Uh -huh. So what else did you see? Well, now I didn't make note of the individual things, but basically oh. the content of, um, of the suitcase is the film. It yeah. talks about the different parts of the film. Right. Yeah, I remember the ping pong paddle and the Curious George, but I thought there was and at least one other thing Like, in I there. wonder, was there a Bubba Gump hat? Like, the hat from... It could have been that, or I was wondering the Medal of Honor. But anyway, yeah. there was a bunch of stuff in there that was just... I thought this was great visual storytelling. Yeah. It was foreshadowing the rest of the film, and it was done very subtly. I know. We should go back. I wonder, I wonder if I can get... And um, then, of course, then they, they bring the, the feather back at yes. the end of the film. Yeah. So that was good filmmaking. And it was super subtle because he picks up the feather and he puts it in the book. So right. then years later... Right. Well, I guess maybe... See, I, this time I was paying closer attention because I'd seen the movie before. Right. But I think when we first saw it, I don't think I would have caught that because it was very subtle. I didn't either. And so from the park bench... He tells the story of his life and we bounce back and forth. And then at some point, someone on the park bench says, because he's there to meet Jenny and he doesn't know this, but his son. And so the woman says, oh, it's just five blocks that way. So I thought this was also because running has been a theme in Forrest's life. Right. Yeah. And so he go, he's like, really? And he just grabs his suitcase and he goes running. And now he's running the five blocks to get to Jenny. So then... He meets Jenny and Little Forest, and Jenny asks him to marry her, which I totally forgot that. I didn't I remember did they got married. Well, it's a very short scene. There's not a lot to it. But it is important because Lieutenant Dan shows up with his new titanium legs, so yep. that was an important piece. And then Jenny gets sick, and I always assumed it was HIV. So did I. But somewhere, I think maybe it was in the wiki article, said that they left it ambiguous but that it could either be hep c or hiv yeah i thought there was a point in there where he said something like he says something about would, a virus yeah but it was like new or sweeping or something yeah he says it new was virus. definitely implied and so hep c probably wouldn't have been a new virus not in, new yeah yeah that's that's probably why i but, thought um um and so Forrest is going to school. Little Forrest is going to school and he, and he takes out the curious George book and he opens it and I saw the feather fall out and I was like, Oh my gosh, I never saw that before. And yeah. then Forrest picks it up. I, I didn't remember that from before, but I think I was on, on the lookout for the feather. Got to say from a costuming perspective, mm -hmm. um, they put Haley Joel Osment as little Forrest into the most oversized shorts I can possibly imagine. They were like parachutes. 
they they must have cinched the belt super tight to try to get those. It was kind of ridiculous how oversized they were. Are you talking about when he first meets him? Every shot we ever saw, I think. Oh. But yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was cute. I never really noticed this, but they said at different transitions in the film, whenever Forrest is kind of going from, like whenever he's aging and it's a transition, okay, he's in a blue and white plaid Shirt, like shirt. short sleeve, yeah. Yeah, like a button up short uh-huh. sleeve shirt. Uh-huh. And when little Forrest goes to school, yeah. he's wearing a blue and white plaid shirt, button up shirt with a red hat, much like, like Bubba Gump. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so cute. Little well, Haley he Joel was so, was so cute. I have to say, um, everyone grows up, but he's looks like a man now. He doesn't look like a <laughs> A little forest anymore. <laughs> Although I'd love to see him in the red cap and the blue and white shirt and the, and the khaki pants. That'd now. be a, a great costume for <laughs> Halloween, at least. So you asked me about the scene where Jenny runs across the reflecting pool, which I don't think you're supposed to get in the reflecting Pretty pool. Pretty sure, sure there's people there that will tackle you if you try it. <laughs> right. It required visual effects to create the large crowd. Over two days of filming, approximately 1,500 extras were used. At each successive take, the extras were rearranged and moved into a different quadrant away from the camera. With the help of computers, the extras were multiplied to create a crowd of several hundred thousand people. Well, that's good. They, they, they you know, I just like So 1,500 extras got work. So you figure they get yeah. paid $100 a day. So yeah. that was 15, no. $150,000. $150, that's probably cheap for this, I know. for this level of production. <laughs> I know, but to us, it's like, oh my God, we'd love to have that for yeah. our whole budget. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> And then I told you while we were watching it that the Medal of Honor ceremony that Forrest attends with Lyndon B. Johnson was actually from a ceremony of someone named Sammy L. Davis. I don't know if that's Sammy Davis. I don't think it is. I don't think so. And he was awarded the Medal of Honor on November 19th, 1968. And so they just used that ceremony and superimposed Tom Hanks' head onto Davis's body. So I have to say that the when we saw it in the theater the first time, I didn't notice this, but the part where they make JFK's mouth and LBJ's mouths move differently was pretty obviously not accurate. Nixon, they did a little better job on that one. I think for the time. For the time, it was great. It was amazing. But for what we're used to now, yeah. it stuck out. Yeah. Right. My favorite, though, is because... Those are two comedic events. Right. Because here it is the president, right? We're, right. We're, we're raised to have a reverence for these positions. And if you ever get in front of the president, you know, it's like I've always seen people who meet the queen, they get like a briefing on the proper way to um, yeah. curtsy. And so with JFK, he shakes his hand and he says, how does it feel to be an all American or something? Right. And he goes, I've got to pay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and JFK turns and goes, I think he said he has to pee. And he's like yeah. amused by it. He's not offended right. at all. And then with Lyndon B. Johnson, he says something about, I think it was, I got <laughs> shot in the butt off. <laughs> and Lyndon said something like, I'd like to see that or something. Yeah, And then he shows and him. So he just BAs the president. Right. <laughs> And he turns around and I can't remember now what Lyndon B says, but it's like, he's amused also. Like nobody's offended by Forrest's actions They're You know, he's just a lovable fella. Because he's simple. And I guess you could put this under the tropes category of kind of like the, you know, the guy who's so simple, he's wise, right? That's a fairly common. Yeah. And he kind of sees through, he's not distracted by all the silliness that others are. He just, you know, approaches life very simply. Yep. Even though he's like a descendant from the KKK leader. Like, I forgot that. But well, he was named after him. And, oh, and, was, that's right. And but I, had, I thought she said, because I wrote down descendant. Oh, it could very named well Named after well. one of our descendants. Yeah. So when I first saw the film, I was unaware of Nathan Bedford Forrest's role but I did look it up. He didn't actually found the KKK. He was just like an early, very visible member. Well, I mean, I'm trying to give his family as much <laughs> as they can get, right? Like He's like, he showed up at the meetings, but he, he didn't found it. When we first saw that part of the film and Forrest's reaction to the KKK was kind of like, oh, well, they just, you know, dressed up funny, even their horses. I, 
I was like, is he, is this like taking a pro KKK stance? But I think it was supposed to just be that Forrest was simple and he didn't understand kind of the, the context of that. But it was, it was interesting from a storytelling perspective, you know, that's kind of risky to not go hard against the KKK in your movie. Well, it's interesting you say that because the studio partway through, like the budget was getting out of hand. And so the studio <laughs> cut bet. some mechas like, like $10 million, like you get right. 10 million less. And so he had to leave out several planned shots. And one of them was Forrest running into um, Dr. King and his supporters Oh, and wow. he distracted several dogs from attacking King and the other supporters by playing fetch with them <laughs> <laughs> and rendering them harmless to King as well as oh. the people that were there. So it's interesting because I wonder if that was to balance, you know. Yeah, yeah, to probably make him. But then we have the, the scene where Forrest is in, in Montgomery, Alabama. And, and he, Right. Well, and like with the students at the university. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought it was interesting. I, I obviously... The football coach is supposed to be Paul Bear Bryant, yep. um, given the hound's tooth hat. Yep. But this part I didn't remember. First of all, we we almost see a little twig and berries of, of Hanks. There's a I shower know. scene there. And that towel was pretty low down there. I know. I wonder if he was wearing a sock or he just went. I think they gave him a merkin. But, <laughs> but then they're kind of like, oh, that boy. I think it might have been more realistic at that time that he would have been kicked off the team. What, doing what? After he was seen helping the black girl at the school integration. Oh, really? I just think they, they wouldn't want anybody to step out of line or to cause, bring any sort of concern onto the football team. You you would be, that would have been the end of that. But, you know, it's a film that we made in 94, so it's a little different. Because the governor and the president of the university were against admitting the black students, but... Kennedy called in and said, no, you have to let them in. It's against the law for you not. Right. And I was, I was actually talking to a friend about this on Monday that when you stop and look at it, it's just how ludicrous it is to say, well, based on skin color, like this one group if, has to go over here, but everybody else goes over there. It's so ridiculous. Like, it, it, I mean, at the time, people, oh, yeah, that's just the way things are, right? But looking back on it from now, we're like, oh, this is kind of seems silly. And like I said, I always think of, I take things to the absurd extreme. Like, how do you do that test? You know, there's a famous paper bag test. So what's the dividing line? Hey, guys, why don't we, instead of building twice as many schools, just let everybody go. Right. So it's just it's one of those things where to us... It it was kind of a cute little scene with Forrest, but at the time it was a very contentious and possibly violent kind of thing. So that's where this film is a little bit kind of that like that magic realism and that it reimagines things in, in kind of a like a less I mean, not that less violent than Quentin well, I was Tarantino. Gonna say, <laughs> Bubba does die in Vietnam, but even the Vietnam War is kind of presented in some sense as less traumatic than maybe people who were there felt it was. So that's just, but that's Forrest's perspective. So I think it makes sense mm -hmm. in the narrative that he would view these things as less complicated than we do. Mm -hmm. So as character development goes, Forrest has to deal with over the course of his life, people treating him less than first, it was because of his legs. And do we think he had like polio or... Do you think well, anything was wrong with his legs? Because, well, again, this film kind of plays a little fast and loose with, fast. with facts. But the doctor says his legs are strong, but his back is as crooked as a politician. So yeah, it does. scoliosis probably. Yeah, but you generally don't. The brace goes on the spine, not on the legs. So as I mean, it sets up the scene where he runs and they fly off. That was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't really feel like Forrest changed at all throughout this film. I mean, he physically got older, but as an individual, I don't feel like Forrest changed. Yeah, he probably didn't. I was trying to see if like through the, like through his love for Jenny. His love for Jenny remains constant the yep. entire time. Um, yep. And he kind of had the same outlook. But it's interesting you mentioned before the running perspective, there's this theory that people who like running are running away from something. I don't know if that's true or not, but the subconscious 
But I think it actually holds true here. First, he was running away from the bullies, right? And then you could argue that his cross-country running, he was running away from, you know, what had happened with Jenny, right? But then you could flip it around and say he was running to something because at the end, when on the park bench, he runs to Jenny. So, but when he's, uh, I guess in Vietnam also, he's running away from the bad guys, but then he runs back in to save his friends. So it's an interesting perspective that running is a, a consistent theme for Forrest. Yeah, I was trying to think if, like, does he, because he ends up taking care of Jenny and then taking care of Forrest, little Forrest. So, but I guess the, his whole, because he was taking care of Bubba, he was taking care of Lieutenant Dan, he, yeah, like, just, and like when he made it big with like Apple, he sent Bubba's family money and he sent Lieutenant right. Dan money. And I just feel like he was kind of the same person all I along. Oh, I think you're right. Okay. Lieutenant Dan wasn't, though. He changed. He did? He got more bitter and more angry? But then he got better. And he, and he met, like, Susan or whatever. So I thought this was fascinating. Everyone, including the studio, was very concerned about Tom Hanks, his accent. What affect was he going to use as portraying right. Forrest? And would it get them in trouble, like you said, for mimicking and making fun of Someone with maybe a lower IQ or a, you know, a I mean, condition of some sort. Right. Yeah. And so, and Tom didn't know how he was going to do it. And Zemeckis stressed that in the film, it talked about a heavy accent. And so he wanted him to have a heavy accent. So Tom just started hanging out with the actor, Michael Connor Humphreys, who played young Forrest. Mm. And he kind of had the affect and so tom thought instead of the young actor trying to mimic, mimic uh, whatever tom adopted tom mimicked the young boy who was from the south i was gonna say was he even from alabama because i do not have a tuned ear to tell the difference between alabama and georgia and right. different accents but i bet you people down there do. oh i bet they do and that's what was i curious hey i know a guy from georgia i'll have to ask there you go and so I just thought that was so cool. And at first, the studio head, Sherry Lansing, was like, absolutely not. He cannot do that accent. It is horrific. You're going to get us in trouble. Like, oh, wow. And Zemeckis was like, nope, that's the accent. We're sticking with it. And he held to his guns. Okay. So I got to say, speaking of accents, it just kind of reminded me I'd heard that Mike Myers recorded uh, the the dialect for Shrek three separate times. The third one was the Scottish accent, mm. but there was a couple others. I and remember then, that now. That you then, say it. which reminds me of fun trivia Larry Miller mentioned is that in at least a certain series of films in England, the actors that play the Native American tribes from the U.S. area, they for some reason cast them with like New York Jews. And he thought that was hilarious. And I agree that it's very, very funny to have a different accent. So I thought, was that what they were afraid Hanks doing that accent would look like, that it was unrealistic and that it was a gag? Right. 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 Or, but also, as you or said, just making is fun. he's making fun and yeah. then people are writing letters. The line, my name is Forrest Gump, people call me Forrest Gump, was an ad lib from Tom, by Tom Hanks, and Zemeckis liked it so much he kept it in the film. And then my last little bit here is... Just a couple years previously, Sally Field and Tom Hanks played a couple in Punchline. And in this film, oh, right. she's only 10 years older than he is <laughs> playing his mother. Well, as we've established, she was a little bit of a good time girl. So <laughs> The character. Right, Mrs. right, right. Mrs. Gump. But not Mrs. Sally. Mrs. Gump could have been 16 years older than Forrest is all I'm saying. The Library of Congress uh, selected this film for preservation in the National Film Registry in December of 2011 as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. I actually think that is true both from a pop culture kind of quotability standpoint as well as actually as a film. So I'm okay with that. You asked me this. I have been waiting to tell you this the whole since we've seen this film. The Park Bench that Tom Hanks sat on for much of the movie was located at the historic Savannah, Georgia, Chippewa Square. The fiberglass bench he sat on since then has been removed and placed in a museum to avoid it being destroyed by bad weather or possibly stolen. 
The church where the feather first falls was about a hundred yards down the street from the bench. And to this day, the bench is held in the Savannah History Museum in Savannah, Georgia. Well, that's cool. I know. I thought you would like that. But if you go there, there's no bench today. Unless you go to Savannah. Uh, yeah, unless you go to the museum. The museum. Yeah. Sorry. If you yeah. go to the square, it's not going to be there. It's not going to be there. I loved the soundtrack for this movie. It's interesting. Did you like the, the, the score composed by, I think it's Alan Silvestri? It is. Or the um, or the, the songs chosen by the music director or both? Both. But the songs that Zemeckis chose definitely put you in that 1970s anti-war protest like vibe to me. So again, how much did he have to pay? Because there right. were some big name songs. Right, exactly. All right. Was there any head trauma in Forrest? There Tom? there was. Forrest got hit by rocks thrown by bullies. Not exactly sure if any of them hit his head directly, but they came awfully dang close. Forrest got in four good punches on the guy in the car who's trying to get busy with Jenny. And then Wesley slaps Jenny. And then Forrest lands seven good punches on Wesley, the weaselly commie, and then he meets at the Black Panther meeting. So there was a fair amount of head trauma. Mm. Some Forrest got, some Forrest gave. Yeah, mostly he gave a whooping. Which maybe would have made more sense if he was like 6'3", 350, but, uh, you know. All right, go Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, any smoochies between Forrest and Jenny? Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. Yes, Jenny kisses Forrest on the cheek in her dorm room after his premature... And then she kisses Forrest when she visits him in the middle of the nighttime rainstorm in his room. Her parting... You got something in your throat. I do. Oh, and that's it. That's it. Okay. And how about a driving review in Forrest Gump? All right. So we we have some interesting vehicles. The the uh, the Internet Movie Cars database page has quite a few entries. Some highlights though. The school bus, oddly still used in the end of the film as well, and the same bus driver, uh, was <laughs> a, a forty one Chevy heavy duty bus. I didn't know that Chevy ever did buses. That's interesting. I'm familiar with the Bluebird and some other. They're in town when he first runs. He like runs through town. He doesn't stop running. There's a gorgeous ivory 54 Chevy Bel Air, which is interesting because at the time that would have been a new car. So it probably would have looked new, but it was uh, gorgeous. When the the bullies are chasing him, it, it's a patinaed 52 Ford F1 pickup. But we both noticed the Confederate flag license plate on the front that lets us know kind of where they stand These on this issue. These are bad issue, boys. Right. Then when... They go hitch or he goes hitchhiking. It's a 66 Pontiac GTO. Now, that's an interesting car choice for a person to pick up a hitchhiker. Now, those cars were big back then. They made them properly sized. But you would think a GTO is driven by a young person who wants to go fast. Probably wouldn't stop on the highway, I guess. I think old person. But who knows? Then when uh, Jenny sneaks out after she visits him the night before in the rainstorm... It's a 74 Buick Century station wagon as a taxi. And I don't know how common that was back then. I would have to have to ask somebody who took a lot of taxis back then. You'd see that for airport taxis, but that I think where he lived was a fair distance away. Don't know. And lastly, when he does Jenny the favor of demolishing her childhood home, uh, Caterpillar D8, the D8, good, good Caterpillar model there. Great for demolition, apparently. Didn't know that. That's a victorious scene. Like you're just so, even though Jenny, I don't think is alive. She is not around for that. Earlier on, she threw her shoes at it, which I understand the, the, uh, the emotion of that. Shoes not as effective as a Caterpillar D8. So for us, right, he, right. he got he, the job done. He did. Shall we go to the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. Okay. There's a couple little tidbits I'm going to go through. So I mentioned that they cut the budget. And and Zemeckis had those running scenes where he's running through. And I forgot this, that he ran. Um, let's see. So they were living in Alabama and he ran to Santa Monica. And then he wasn't tired of running. So he ran up to Maine. <laughs> and then they showed him running maybe back down to the southwest and and the studio was just like, you can't do all those scenes. It's too expensive. 
And so Zemeckis hired Jim Hanks, Tom's younger brother, and he doubled as Forrest because, you know, he not by now he's got all of the beard and everything on and has a hat and all, long hair. And so it's easy to kind of hide that it's not exactly Tom Hanks. And there was basically a secret second unit. And when the studio found out about it, they saw the raw footage. And so they relented. And the only scene that is still missing because only the scene at Monument Valley is, was still missing because they'd run out of money. But since the studio refused to pay for it, Hanks and Zemeckis did it themselves. Wow. But they had to have extras because that's the shot where people yeah, there's were running a line behind, behind him. him. So, Okay, how much of Tom Hanks was Tom Hanks at this time? Was cuz I mean now him spotting a day of shooting for that is would would well, seem reasonable financially. Wait for it. He didn't okay. he didn't just pay for that. When the studio imposed the budget cuts, both Zemeckis and Tom Hanks waived a large part of their fee in exchange for per- percentage points, which ultimately netted Hanks in the region of 40 million dollars. Yeah, he's doing okay. Yeah. It's the fastest growing Paramount film to pass the 100 million, 150 million, and 200 million mark as of February of 2008. It took 66 days to film. Apart from the fixed fee of $350,000, author Winston Groom made a deal for a 3% share of the film's profits. However, he never received money from this source, even though the film turned out turned in more than 350 million in revenue, the studio employed creative accounting by claiming that the movie actually lost money after correcting for costs of production and advertising and groom tried to sue the studio for money, but to appease him, they settled by buying the rights of his sequel Gump and company for a seven figure sum, as well as a percentage of the box office from the adaptation. Unfortunately, groom, a sequel never materialized before his death in 2020. Yeah, so kids, don't work with the studios, yeah. right? That's not the first time we've heard of the <laughs> studios claiming like, oh, this movie didn't make any money. It yeah, $350 million, but it didn't make any money. That's kind of ridiculous. Right. But I have to say, you know, at the risk of sounding like Martin Scorsese, this was not a Marvel film, and look how much money it made. So you can make financially profitable films without needing some sort of existing IP. Right. So it had a budget of 55 million domestically. It made 330 million worldwide. It made 680 million and adjusted for today. That would be like 846.4 million. So quite the coup on IMDb. It is 8.8 out of 10 critics gave it 71% and unless like last week's film, Audiences loved it even more, giving it 95%, which is not a surprise. This is right. A, this is a beloved a, film. Yes. And like you mentioned, it's a bit long at two hours, 22 minutes, two, two, two. Yeah. If yeah. you're a numerologist, um, it's rated PG 13 and is labeled as a drama romance. And it ended up at Paramount Pictures. It won 50 awards and got 74 nominations. It won six Academy Awards for Best Picture. Tom won for Best Actor, Zemeckis won for Best Director, Eric Roth won for Best Screenplay, and Arthur Schmidt, oh, oh, here we go, Arthur Schmidt won for Best Editing, you always want the editor to win. Yeah, I think he really did great work on this one. Yes, so you called it. All right. And then Best Visual Effects, and it also won three Golden Globes for Best Picture, Tom Hanks, and then Zemeckis won again for Best Director. Did Robin Wright get the MTV award for best song performed while nude on a stool? (laughs) No, but Zemeckis told the guy who throws a drink at her, throw it at her legs. We don't want to have to redo our makeup. (laughs) Well, and something I I noticed this time around is it appears that she is wearing a flesh colored thong. I saw that too. Yeah. Yeah. But it was really well done. It matched her flesh tone very, very well. All right. Let's see what we're watching next week. Okay, next week we will be watching our first listener pick. It's Lee's pick, Superfan Lee, and we will be watching The Princess Bride. Inconceivable. No, we will be. Have fun storming the castle. Okay, so that should be interesting to see that film, but never forget. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 
Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 